Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Women's History Month event for today. Uh, my name is Anastasia Panagakos. I'm a professor of anthropology and co-chair with Diana Reed of Women's History Month 2018. And we welcome all of you to this event. Thank you for uh, braving the weather. Uh, I understand probably a lot of you had a hard time getting to campus today, so we're really happy to see you. Um, and to um, welcome our speaker, Mariah Lichtenstern, who will be speaking in, in just a little bit. Um, a few little housekeeping things before we get to uh, the introduction. Um, just to remind everyone, that if you're here for a class and you need to sign in, uh, there are sign-in sheets in the lobby. Please also be sure to silence your cell phones uh, before the presentation begins. And also that this presentation is being video recorded, so just that you know that. I would also just like to take a moment to thank um, CRC and our campus in general for allowing us to bring speakers to campus. Um, this is really important to us because we think part of the learning process is getting to hear the perspectives of people who are out in the real world and are doing really interesting, cool things. And so we wanted to thank the Cultural Competence and Equity Committee who've provided funding to allow us to have Women's History Month events, to Michael Bittner who has um, helped us with videotaping and putting together these presentations, um, to my co-chair Diana Reed and to Hong Nin who um, helped bring Mariah's work to our attention. And we would also like to thank um, LaTanya Williams, who is our new Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences. And she is going to come on up and introduce our speaker for today. So please welcome Dr. Williams. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. On this rainy day, I'm so happy and privileged to be here today with you on behalf of the Humanities and Social Science Division and the broader campus community. I'd like to first thank the members of the Women's History Month Committee for their contribution and commitment to creating a dynamic, diverse, and thought-provoking set of Women's History Month programs for our campus community. I know that this type of service is oftentimes taken for granted and unrecognized, but I want you to know that your service and labor in this area does not go unnoticed by the students, your peers, and the administration. So thank you. So let's give the Women's History Month Committee a round of applause. So this morning, I really have the honor and the pleasure of introducing today's Women's History Month speaker. We are fortunate, CRC, to host this accomplished entrepreneur, digital production pioneer, activist, and worldwide traveler, and importantly, a role model for women all across the state. Our guest speaker's professional experiences lie at the intersection of technology, entertainment, and venture capital. A woman who has devoted her career to addressing social, economic, and environmental inequity through entrepreneurship. She is a multifaceted bridge builder that serves to build bridges between those with privilege and those with valuable but underutilized perspectives. To showcase and capitalize on diverse perspectives, she co-founded Diverse City Ventures, an impact-oriented micro VC firm and subsidiary Cinescheres.com or dot club which connects filmmakers and stakeholders from script to screen. She is driven to empower founders and filmmakers of all backgrounds with special interest in those underrepresented by virtue of otherness, including gender, culture, geography, and socioeconomic status. Our guest speaker is also the co-founder, is also the co-director of Founder Institute in Sacramento and a frequent speaker, mentor, and judge. 
She currently serves on the Tech Advisory Committee for Clean Tech Fund, CalSeed, and is a member of UCLA Ventures. As importantly, ladies and gentlemen, she is a proud alumna of California's most prominent and prestigious public and private universities, UC Berkeley, UCLA, and USC. Let's give our keynote speaker, Mariah Lichtenstern, a strong and embracing CRC welcome. Wow, thank you so much, Tanya. It's so good to be here, and thank you, Anastasia and Hong, and I also want to give a shout out to um, to uh, Francis over at uh, Cal State. Really appreciate the support in Sacramento. Um, so yes, I, I did go to some wonderful schools. I am also a product of the uh, this, the uh, junior college here in, Sac in Sacramento. Um, I took some continuing education classes here, and um, this is a wonderful springboard into the to into many places. So I'm so glad to be here and to meet all of you. Now, just as we get started, it always helps me to kind of know who's in the room. So I understand there's some film students here. How many of you are in media or film? Okay, wow, almost half, wonderful. And how many of you consider yourselves entrepreneurial? Okay. So some of, some of you are considering pursuing entrepreneurship, okay. All right, um, how many of you consider yourself artists? Okay. Well, as we get started, I would just put forth that art and creation is entrepreneurial, and entrepreneurship is art. There's a lot in common, and I hope that I'm able to bridge some of those commonalities as we go forward today. So <clears throat> I thought we'd just get started just by sharing a little bit about my background and, and my path specifically to entrepreneurship. Um, has anyone here, does ever, anyone has uh, entrepreneurs in their family? Just a couple, okay. Well, uh, in my background, my grandmother was the first woman in the workforce. She was a jeweler from West Virginia, came cross country following my grandfather who was in World War II. And my mother was the first woman to go to a vocational school. She was a director of nursing. So I am the first in my generation, first on my mother's side, uh, first generation to attend college. I'm the second uh, sibling on my father's side to attend college. And I grew up with the notion that you go to school, you get the best education that you can get, so you can get the best job that you can get. Has anyone else been raised like that? Okay. No one told me, well thankfully I, was, I learned about financial aid, which, without which I would not have been able to go to college. But no one told me about debt burdens. No one told me about that. And I didn't really have, I didn't really have uh, examples of entrepreneurship early on. I mean, my, my dad had I can project in the rain jar. <laughs> but uh, my stepfather had a small business and it, and it went under and went into trucking, bought his own truck. Uh, but I didn't really have an example of entrepreneurship or enterprise. So when I found my way into um, UC Berkeley, it was actually a Ghanaian friend of mine who was working at what was then Solomon Smith Barney. And some stockbrokers had given him some books by Robert Kiyosaki. And he was so excited and felt he was just such a, such a good friend and wanted the best for me. And so he actually said, Mariah, I want you to read these books. This is you. So one of them was Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and the other one was Cash Flow Quadrant. And that was the first time that my eyes were really opened to entrepreneurship. Now at that time, I was uh, studying media. And my major was actually rhetoric of narrative and the image. And so the, the way that narrative and images convey messages and, and persuade, and that could be commercials. It could be the way a city is laid out. So uh, anyone here familiar with redlining? Okay, so it was a practice of uh, you know, marking some areas of cities as you know, color coding them as to their economic viability. And it was actually a, a, a there we go. It was actually an institutionalized practice uh, whereby banks would not invest in certain areas. They wouldn't grant loans to certain areas which happened to be occupied by people of color. That's rhetoric. That's communicating something. 
and uh, you know, naturally the music that we listen to. So I had become sensitized to media and the portrayals of people of color particularly and how that informs not only how the world perceives us, but also how we perceive ourselves. So I don't know, I'm, I'm gonna give my age away a little bit. Like my gray hairs aren't already doing enough. But uh, at that time, you know, I, I came up listening to people like DJ Jazzy Jeff and the Fresh Prince, Public Enemy. MC Light, MC8, Yo-Yo. Just got to hang with her this Saturday at a, at a conference my friends put on best, for best friends only. This is what I, what I came up with. So mostly positive, uplifting, right? But then things started to shift in the early 90s and it got to be like um, Easy e Dog Pound, Death Row, Lil' Kim. Right. In fact, I almost, I almost had playing that uh, Money, Power, Respect. Have you, you guys know that song, Money, Power, Respect? The key to life. Okay, let me not backslide. <laughs> but this is what I grew up with. This is what I was listening to. This is what I came of age to. And I saw the shift between the romance songs of like the early 90s to kind of like, I don't know if you can call it romance now. <laughs> Something else is not exactly romance. Uh, and so I saw how media was impacting my culture, my friends, my community and how people in the, community, the communities that I lived in were perceived because of that, how I was perceived because of that, walking into the room as a light-skinned woman with long hair, okay, light-skinned black woman, because some of y'all are like, you ain't light-skinned. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, colorism. And I, and I wanted to understand, especially, you know, I mentioned I, um, you know, my mother's background. My mother, uh, she always told us we're German and Scotch-Irish. I'm a, I'm a person of mixed ethnic descent. I'd be like, you're German and Scotch-Irish, I'm black. <laughs> okay, so she raised us in it, my brother and I in a small town, and it was, it was very hostile, actually. Every day it was, you know, fighting battles and being called everything by my name. And I wanted to understand those dynamics, and so I was really drawn to how media impacted those perceptions, and how the media told us who we were, and how the media normalized dysfunction and how it shaped the way that we interact with each other because of that. And so just a, you know, it's a quick, quick statistic to illustrate the point. Uh, I read a stat that 75% of Caucasian Americans in this country have zero black friends. And 90% have no exposure to black people outside of work or you know, maybe go into the city and, and, and see some people here and there. And for uh, African Americans, it's something around the uh, realm of 70%. So we live in de facto segregation. So oftentimes, what we believe about each other is influenced by what we see in the media and limited interactions, right? Or the ones that really stand out. You ever notice that like the really flaming gay people that are in the gay pride parade, they, they stand out? But there's so much diversity in the LGBTQ community, right? There's so much diversity in the black community. There's so much diversity amongst white cultures and other cultures, right? So how we are, how we are portrayed in the media, perceive, it, it affects how we perceive each other and ourselves and the models that we pursue. So I was fascinated by that, but I had no exposure to entrepreneurship. So my friend Kojo exposed me to this and that began my trajectory to want to um, to get into, into business and entrepreneurship. And I had been working with filmmakers and I realized they did not like business and entrepreneurship. They like creating artistic stuff. And I, I'm into that too, but I realized that I had more power and influence by enabling others to create. And so I wanted to strive to open doors for others. And that's what led me on my path to entrepreneurship. So I say that to preface what I hope for you to gain from this presentation. Now bear with me on this. What I hope that you gain from this presentation is the following. Let's see if this works. It looks fancy. Money, power, and respect. Okay? Now bear with me, because I know you're already looking at me like, what is this woman? I thought you were cool. You sounded all social justice. And now I'm questioning that. And I want you to question why you might question that, if you are questioning it. I don't want to assume. Don't want to be prejudiced. Okay? Now I'm not saying be motivated by money, power, and respect. But what I am saying, and some of you may have heard this, how many have heard power corrupts? <clears throat> and ultimate power corrupts, absolute power, thank you, corrupts absolutely. Have we heard that? 
Well, what we have today in our country and in our world is an imbalance of power that has led to unprecedented corruption. And so I want you to pursue these things, not because you're necessarily motivated by them. I'm not going to judge you if you are, OK? I'm not going to judge. But pursue them because we need to strike a change in the balance of power. I'm looking around the room. I see a lot of diversity. And we need a diversity in who holds power as well, OK? So hopefully, that, hopefully you're not judging me now for being like greedy and stuff. <laughs> OK, and, and let's kind of contextualize this a little bit more in terms of women. Because it's Women's History Month, right? Hello, women. <laughs> women. Money is power. And women lack both especially when it comes to the concentration of wealth. This is just a you know, statistic about the number of, of billionaires, and this is from a recent Forbes report, report. This is actually from a New York Times article that came out, I think, a couple days ago. Okay. Of those billionaires, only 227 are women, and most of them inherited their wealth. This is in the highest ranks. And again, money's power, right? But what about the rest of the ranks? We are in an era of unprecedented income inequality. We have not had this much income inequality since the Great Depression. And the bulk of that, you can see in that little black area, that's a, the actual distribution of wealth. The bulk of it is in the hands of 1%. And it's mostly men. And it's mostly older men. And, th and men are not the problem. Men are not the problem. I love men. I'm married to a man, been married 14 years. Got brothers, was raised by boys. I can get along with guys better than most. So men are not the problem, but it's power that's held by a concentrated culture. And that, that culture influences every aspect of our world. And it's not even healthy. It's not even healthy. It's an unhealthy culture where money is driving decisions more than humanity, more than what's good for our world, our oceans, our rivers, our environment, the masses. So this is the actual distribution here. And it was, you see that far off to the right, it was so far off the charts that they had to, they, they cut, cut the top and put it over here so you could see it. There, this movie is available online, Wealth uh, Inequality in America is free online. And this disproportionately impacts women. This is a, just an example of women's workforce uh, participation in the highest ranks. You see the top 10%, uh, top 1%, top 0.1%. So the higher the income earning, the lower the participation of women. And in the past 10 years, the partic participation of women in the workforce has actually gone down. And the leading reasons are disability and caregiving. And I want to come back to that. Hopefully, we'll have time to come back to, to that and some of the solutions here, OK? And then you look at the gender pay gap, and you visualize that. It's further broken down by ethnicity. Latina, Hispanic women are actually the lowest paid compared to the white male dollar. And again, not scapegoat and blaming white men. White men are not the problem. But this is a problem, OK? And so what we find is we're in a position of inequity, whereby we're subject to abuses of power to maintain power. And in media and technology, these are industries that have the most power and the most wealth. Media is highly influential, as we discussed earlier. And this is why we have such low participation. So if you, if you look at it, we'll come to some more, some more numbers. But if you look at a 50% participa labor participation rate, women are 51% of the population. If 50% of the women are in the workforce, then most industries should have at least 25% women. Can we agree to that? Can we agree to that math? OK. 
So what we find ourselves in is a, is a place of in, inequity. And I started, the, you saw in the opening slide that the topic today is about equity in media and technology, right? So what is equity? When I'm talking about equity you have in your house or equity on your balance sheet, equity is justice. Equity is what's right. There's actually a special court of equity that came from our, our Western justice system, or as a, Mr. Sessions called it, our Anglo-Saxon law. <laughs> I don't know if all you are up on that, but um, there was a separate court of equity. So there's a court of law and there's a court of equity. And here in America, those courts have been combined in all but one state, which is Delaware. I don't know why. Uh, but equity serves to remedy injustices outside of the law, that the law doesn't remedy. So this is not about equality. You can say, oh, we all have equal access to education. Anyone can, can apply and, and get into a, you know, a college. Anyone can pay to go. But if I'm a third generation college student with a nice trust fund, it's a lot easier for me to go, isn't it? And let's take it down. Let's, let's just say that we have two people with traffic tickets. Somebody is wealthy and has a traffic ticket, and someone is dirt poor working three jobs and has a traffic ticket. Oh, it's equal, it's equal justice. They both have to pay $50, but one can't pay their light bill. One can't make it to court without taking off from work and losing three, four hours. Maybe they're paid $10 an hour if they're lucky. And now they can't pay their phone bill because they had to take off of work. Maybe they don't go, and so now they have a warrant. Or their fi fines compound. The rich person, oh, psh, I'm not even going to go to court. I'm going to pay that Mickey Vicky. It's not worth my time. It's not equal, right? It's not equitable. So we can see here the, 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 the equality here and the equity here. And then, you know, this is our reality. We have some people, not by virtue of anything that they did or did not do, who are just born with certain privileges. And some are set behind. And this has been systematic. It's not like our history books are hidden. You know? There are people alive right now whose parents or grandparents were slaves who are still, still psychologically and emotionally impacted, not just black people. There were people who were forced to be overseers. That was the only job in town. Do you think that wasn't traumatic and didn't influence generations and lead to proclivities? This is systematic, and so some people are behind and some people are ahead. So we have to be intentional about rectifying that. So let's, let's go back to media and look at the inequity in the media industry. This is just a participation of women in media. So we see that women are more active in documentaries than in films, which incidentally don't pay quite as well as feature films. And there's some more contextualization we could do around that. But directors, writers, producers, editors, cinematographers, just had a, a, a woman nominated in cinematography. Did you guys see that? For the Oscars? For, uh, what was that? Anybody know the, the, the Mudbound? Anybody see that? Good movie, it's on Netflix. This is the participation of women. And this is, you know, mostly, uh, you know, producers are above the line. I don't know if you guys are into all that terminology, but uh, the creatives above the line tend to be the higher paid. And then there's the, the below the line, the crew. But here's the tastemakers. And let's just look again. Women are 51% of the population. People of color in this country are 40%. By 2040, it's going to be a minority majority. So th this is a, the, the demographics. But look at the representation. Filmmakers don't reflect the audiences that they serve. And the, the decision makers, 100% male studio. Now this is. This is from uh, about 2015, 16, so some, some things have changed slightly. The studio directors are up 6%, and there's a reason for that. Um, but this is, this is relatively new. So these are the decision makers. These are the people in power. These are the people who decide who gets hired, who gets deals. And that leads to the representation, the projects that are created. So you can see here, in our current dynamics, this is how women are represented. 
26% of women get partially naked. 28% wear sexually revealing clothes. 30% have a, of, of speaking characters are women. 17% actually including extras. And again, we're 51% of the population. So when we are in movies, we're presented as sexualized beings. We're objectified. And then you wonder why there's sexual harassment, and it's like a, it's like a it's a cycle, right? Because that behavior is normalized, and women subscribe to it because that's the only way that they can attain power, unless they decide to be outliers or to go against the system or stay home with the kids, or whatever the case may be. They don't fight the power. Going back to that public enemy. <laughs> Look at this, teenage females. Depicted with nudity has increased 32%. Then we wonder why sexual trafficking is up. We wonder why kidnapping is up. I just learned 60,000 black women are abducted each year and it's not even covered. My, one of my friend's daughters, she graduated from USC with production, a degree in production, she's making a movie, it's on Kickstarter, wish I knew the name, Akila Blair. I can't remember the name of the, of the film. But she's doing a, a film on this. 60,000 per year, that's a lot. And what, what's driving that? What's driving the sex trafficking? What's driving child por pornography and things like that? It's what, what we're conditioned to desire. There are studies that show that, that these images release dopamines into our brain. And just like food or drugs, it's literally been added to uh, the, the journal Psychology, that pornography creates addiction. Same behaviors, where you seek it and seek it, and you gotta have more and more and more. And this is what we're conditioning our men to consume. So again, the problem is not the men, but this is a problem. This is a problem that's impacting the way that men and women perceive each other and get along. You know, my husband, he's from Botswana, and they, they don't allow pornography, they don't have strip clubs, nothing like that. And I was like, okay, that's cool, because that's one less thing I have to worry about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So why women? Women change that dynamic. When women have some power, and, and not all women are empowering, okay? Women don't get a pass. Because women are influenced by the same things that men are, right? We see the same things, so we're impacted too. But there are slight differences, right? But when, when women have some power, they make different decisions. They increase representation. They're more inclusive. They don't exclude men, but they're more inclusive of other women, women, statistically speaking. And women purchase half of the tickets. And I just recently read some, some statistics about what women like to watch, and it's not chick flicks. I mean, that's cool. I'm down with chick flicks. I like sucker for a love story. But that's not, you know, my favorite type of film, you know? So why are there so few women? And we hear all the excuses. Well, you know, pipeline. Well, 50% of the graduates from film schools are women. And film is not like, you know, a nine to five or, oh, I'm not, you might do how many films in your lifetime? You know, you might be on a film set a couple weeks, few months, depending, you know, you might be at animation a couple of years. You know, you can work on several projects at a time. There was a, when uh, the EEOC began doing an investigation of discrimination and sexism in the film industry, you know, there was a publication that came out about 100 female directors that studios should be hiring. And these were not some, you know, scrappy, unskilled women. These are Academy Award winning women, women who've won Emmys, women who have directed action films, women who have directed animation. There's tons of them. And one of the complaints, you know, is that it, there was women that were packaged on films and when they got to the studio, the studios threw them off and hired men in their homey hookup system. So it's not a pipeline issue. And there's other myths. Oh, they're unwilling, they're unable, their stories won't sell. Do, does anyone recognize this woman here? Mary Pickford, look her up. She worked with Charlie Chaplin. She opened one of the first studios in Hollywood. 
one of the largest studios to turn into an agency. And there were many women involved in, in film in the early days. In fact, most editors were women. And edi editing is a very influential aspect of the filmmaking uh, process. It has a lot to do with the look of a film. And they hired women because women knew how to sew. And so they were, in a sense, sewing film. So there was a, there was a lot of participation of women. But you know what changed that? It was the power dynamics. So the excuses, they don't add up. There's a study done. Anyone familiar with the Bechtel test? OK, so just for some context, the Bechtel test is basically you analyze a movie and you say, number one, are there two or more women? One, with speaking roles. Two, do they speak to each other? And three, do they speak about something other than men? Easy. So there was a, a study done by uh, 538.com on 1,600 films between 1990 and 2013, and this is what they found. There's up to a 37% higher return on inclusion of women, so, and even internationally. So in the US, films that pass the Bechtel test overperform, and internationally they perform just as well as those that don't, and they perform better than those where women only talk about men. So I guess internationally we have some more independent women out there. So it's not about the economics. If it was economics, we wouldn't have so many R-rated films. R-rated films aren't the top performers, it's family films. We'd have a whole lot more Disney films, a whole lot more Pixar films. So it's not that, it's not, it's not about the money. It's not about the demand. You know, they say the same thing about um, protagonists of color. They said for year, oh, they don't sell overseas. Black Panther just crossed the billion dollar mark. Hello. And it's not the first one to top box office. It's not. Denzel Washington, Will Smith, Holly Berry, Samuel Jackson. It's an excuse. There's a study out of UCLA, UCLA uh, Bunch Center does a study every year on diversity in the film industry. And they, they show that films with 30 to 50% diversity are preferred by, they outperform and are preferred by all audiences. So these are the facts. There is an abuse of power. There is rampant discrimination to sustain that power. And there's complacency when that power is abused. So I'm, I'm just going to give a couple quick little stories here. For example, I, I'm going to share my own story. I went to USC. I went to UCLA for motion picture producing. Actually transferred out of USC. <clears throat> and there was a multitude of reasons. You know, you got to fight for your education. <laughs> when you're a woman and when you're a person of color, you have to fight. So I had three great appeals as an undergrad at UC Berkeley. I, of course, uh, won them all. But the burden of proof was on me. The disruption was on my life. And the least, the, the last of, of which uh, impacted my ability to continue at USC. I, w I was able to complete a full year, but I had a great appeal on a requisite class, a class that was required to graduate. And, and it was supposed to take three months to resolve, and it took over a year. So I'd started my second year of USC, and you know it had been resolved in my favor, but they said, but they haven't conferred your degree, so you, you're going to have to take the year off. And three weeks later, the degree came, but it was already done. They could have given me three more weeks, but they didn't. And it wasn't something that I, I could fight. And so it was what it was. And so I had a year off, and I decided I'm going to apply to UCLA. And there was a couple of reasons for that, but one of which was my experience in the first year at USC. I, I was a director on a short film. I was the only woman, the only person of color. I was one of three black people in my class several women, not quite half, class of 20, 20 accepted each year to this program. So I'm directing this project, and these three men won't even look at me. We're in a group discussion, and I'm the director. I've been assigned to direct. And they're talking to each other, and it's as if I'm not even there. And I'm sending emails, and they're not responding. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> I've got to direct this thing. This is not going to work. And I promise you, I am not a diva. 
I promise you. I do give that impression, first impression, I know sometimes I do. But I've had friends who told me, when I first met you, I thought you were stuck up. But you know what, Mariah, you're one of the nicest people I have ever known. So it wasn't because I was being a diva or anything like that. I, I mean, just basically looking someone in the eyes, not hard to do. There's a lot of difficult directors in Hollywood. There's people who throw staplers at you, okay? I've heard all the stories. So I had to go to my professor and get intervention. And he said, oh, you're just being emotional. Well, I had some wisdom from my mama because she was, you know, hippie and all that. She went through the women's lib. And she already told me how to respond to that. I said, I'm not being emotional. Nothing wrong with being emotional. If you're not emotional and you're human, there's a problem. And you might be a sociopath, okay? <laughs> that's another story. So I told him, I said, I'm not being emotional. I'm being emphatic about my right to my education. There's a problem here. I had to go over him to the person who accepted me into the program, Larry Terman, and he said, I don't get what the problem is. I had problems with three different professors. Most of them were wonderful. It was an amazing experience, tremendous privilege that benefits me still to, the day, to this day, okay? But there was, there was a handful. So Larry Terman says, I don't see what the problem is. I teach classes, Mariah's on the front row, she's on time, she participates, I chose her. Why are you having these problems with her? So he intervened, and I ended up proceeding with the project kept the peace on the set, held no grudges. My husband, who has a degree in production, we, were, we weren't engaged at the time, but he was uh, helping on the set. But this one weekend, his friend had passed, and so he was in the Bay Area at, at the homegoing service, and I was on set by myself. And you know, when you're shooting a film, and then we weren't shooting on film, there wasn't, you, you know, you, you got short, short, short uh, stock, I forget what it's called, but short ends, thank you. And so, you know, you, when you're rolling, you're rolling, right? And we're scrappy students, you know? And so, you know, I call action on the set. The film is rolling. And my director comes behind me. And as soon as I call action, claps me on the butt. Thank you. Thank you, my sister. <laughs> Thank you. OK. And so, you know, I said, I am not going to turn around and ruin my shot slapping this mofo and get kicked out of school. I've already been. <laughs> You know, I've already had to deal with letters. Oh, you know, you, you asked for permission to miss a class, and if you miss two classes, you'll be kicked out. I mean, I was, it was, it was harassment. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, I'm not going to assault this guy. So I call action again. He comes and does the exact same thing. Had to take another shot. Did the exact same thing. I'm lit. I'm lit, but I can't show it. So we finish that scene, and he comes up to me, and he's like, you know, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. He wasn't sorry. How many of y'all know he was not sorry? <laughs> but he wanted me to just take that apology and tuck it away. And I forgave him. I'm a very forgiving person. But I also went and reported him to a woman at USC who runs a program to this day, as far as I know. She co-runs a program. A woman. She didn't want to hear it. People don't want to deal with it. It's uncomfortable. It's awkward. Keep it to yourself. It's just a slap on the butt. Come on. Suck it up. Have thick skin. It's entertainment industry. She put out a memo the next day, outlined sexual harassment, warned against it. And there was a nice little clause at the end that oftentimes things that we perceive as sexism or racism are actually personal problems. Oh yeah, that was a personal problem, but it shouldn't have been my problem. So this is a woman, okay? So there's a complacency with this abuse of power. Why, is there cause, why are there Cosby's? Why are there Weinstein's? Why are people getting away with this? The VC's and all that, why? Because if you have a relationship with someone that benefits you and you find out that they're abusing their power, do you want to lose your privilege by standing up to them? Do you want to lose your standing with other people that they have influence over? So there's a complacency. We pander to power. We pander to wealth. And so this is why I created CineShares. And I, and I had started you know, the, the ideating around it before the technology was ready because I saw that there was a lack of access to capital and distribution for underrepresented people and that in turn affected how we were presented as I mentioned earlier. So these are the kinds of things that I wanted to address these, these barriers 
Because if a woman has to choose between accepting being assaulted or marrying someone else who's going to go pursue his career and supporting that person, what is she going to choose? Unless she's a fighter, which I am. I had to defend myself being light-skinned with long hair, okay? So I learned to be a fighter. But you get tired. Even the best champs sometimes take a knockout. So I transferred to UCLA. And ultimately, as I pursued CineShares, which, you know, another story on how I came to that another day, uh, I find myself in, venture ca in, in the technology industry, in Silicon Valley's industry, and guess what? It mirrors Hollywood. Same numbers almost exactly. And again, we, we talked about that number of workforce participation, right? You look at most, most areas, and women are about 25 30%. Right? You know, poor women have higher workforce participation in, you know, uh, middle income, right? Struggle with childcare, et cetera, et cetera. But in these higher levels of power and wealth, lower participation of women. So there's the same excuses in Silicon Valley. Oh, it's pipeline. A women that, oh, they leave. A women aren't, there's a guy came out at Google, talked about women's biology is not suited for technology. Um, excuse me. How many of you watch Hidden Figures? Women created computers. Women wrote code. Look up women in technology. It was a woman who literally began to code that, and, and led to the, to the first computer, Grace Hopper. We say we debug things because of Grace Hopper finding a moth in a computer. She debugged it. Grace Hopper, okay. These women here, this movie is based on a true story about women computers that helped us get to the moon. Women were, were the first coders, and what happened? Going back to, you know, what happened with the women editors and the women filmmakers? Well, when men realized that there was money in these industries and power in these industries. Oh, honey, just go sit over there. Why don't you stay home? Why don't I just subject you to enough microaggressions that you're not going to want to deal with this, that you're not going to want to fight? Besides, you've been socially conditioned, and we portrayed all this media of you as a damsel in distress that needs to be rescued by me, the man. So just step aside. That's what happened. And what happened is that toy companies started marketing computers and games to boys and job descriptions were targeting men. Emily Chang at Bloomberg. Anybody watch Emily Chang, Bloomberg? You guys should get up on that. It's great. Oh, it's just good stuff. It's good media. Emily Chang, I'm, I'm a fangirl. And she just recently published a book, Brotopia. And it talks about, uh, you know, partly why firms so heavily recruited men, and, and it points to this study, I won't even name the scientist because they shouldn't even get credit, and it's probably some whack science like a craniology or something, or race. And uh, they did a study of 2,000 engineers, and they determined that what makes for a good software developer, engineer, programmer, is a dislike of people. You know, so we have a certain stereotype of what programmers are, right? These nerdy guys, antisocial, maybe certain work ethic. And they promoted this, and so that's what people hired. There is a problem when people who don't like people are programming software and services that humanity uses. No wonder we're addicted to technology. No wonder we have so many problematic issues in the tech industry when it's being run by people who don't like people. No wonder we have plastic in the ocean. I'm just saying, when, you're, when people are in power and influence and control and positions that influence our world, you want them to like people, right? You would think that. That's why you need more women making decisions, because they'd be like, honey, now you know that you should hire some people who like people. Okay. And so just like with salaries, this, this impacts women of color. And I'm, I'm a woman of color. I can't deny it. I walk in a room. I can't hide it. 
okay? I'm not, you know, not trying to flash a card. This is just how I was born. I'm a woman, and I like it, and I like being black, okay? But this is what it is. I like being mixed in it, however you want to define me. I like it. I like who I am. I like me. But this is what I have to deal with. So when I'm out there launching CineShares building and I'm out in the industry and I see, you know, my peers, I see people with degrees in, in, in engineering and, and technology management from MIT and Stanford, and they can't get a job at Google and they're being told, we'll call you when we have a marketing position. People like Stephanie Lampkin, Macy Peterson, Joelle Burke, women who won TechCrunch, they can't get a foot in. So I saw what I was working with. And there was a report that came out by Catherine Finney called Proud of Diane. And they identified 88 women that had black women startups. There was no statistics on um, black women. You can see here, 7% 7, 7 of VC funding went to, to women at this time, which had actually gone down. Less than 1% went to black founders, less than 1% to Hispanic founders. And Catherine did some digging and found that 0.02% went to black women. Today, there's been 16 black women who have raised over a million dollars in venture capital. There have been seven black women who've had successful exits. You do the math. That's outstanding. That is uncommon, that's exceptional. And I'm not surprised. Because when you have to work that hard just to exist, just to look at the playing field, like those boxes we saw. I mean, you're talking about media industry and film, you know, it's not even being on the field, it's just being able to see the field and have a dream of being on the field. So when it comes to, to women of color, particularly, just being able to dream of being on the field is hard. Getting on the field is harder. You probably like some Serena Williams type of strong. So I'm not surprised that so many have exits, but that's unacceptable. Total venture deals, 2012 to 2014, over 10,000. Average black woman founder raised 36,000 compared to 1.3 million for the average failed startup by a non-black female, by a, a male, overrepresented male. So these were the numbers. And, and uh, you know, another acquaintance, Richard Kirby, who's a VP at Benrock, did a study, who is a VC? And he looked at who was making the funding decisions, and guess what? It mirrored pretty closely who's getting funding. So by this time, I had, I had applied, I had, when I started CineShares, I was taking classes with the Kaufman Fellows Academy online through Novo Ed. I had taken some technology entrepreneurship classes through Stanford, also online. And uh, got involved with the Kaufman Fellows Society and then the, the vi vice president of uh, Kaufman Fellows Academy recommended me for the Kaufman Fellows Society. So I applied. It's a society that basically trains up the next generation of venture capitalists. And I told her, I said, I see CineShares as, as being venture capital for the entertainment industry, but I'm interested in entrepreneurship and economic empowerment at large. So I'm very interested in venture capital. And she said, well, you should apply to this program. Look into it. And I did. I went through a rigorous process, much like applying to grad school. Went through eight interviews, all that, references. And, and they accepted me um, as a finalist. And so I had to go and interview with VCs, meet VCs. It's not, it's not a very hard industry to get into. So this was already a path that I was pursuing and part of how I, I ended up meeting Richard Kirby and others. And these are the numbers for venture capital and gender and ethnicity. So very, very uncommon for someone like myself to be in the industry. And th when you are in, do you want to be the one who's only bringing deals from people who look like you? Do you want to be that person? Do you want to be exclusive? No. You know, I like to fund bros. I ain't got no problem with bros, unless you got a problem with me. Then we got a problem. So there's only so much that you can do when there's, you know, and, and you, you have pattern matching where people have stereotypes about you or they're trying to preserve certain power, they're trying to hook up their friends. 
It's all kind of dynamics. And then you survey these folks. And this is, this is, and again, white men are not the problem, okay? But these are very influential men of power. They were interview founders and investors in the tech industry about diversity. This is a LinkedIn study. And you can just Google it, it's there. 45% blame the pipeline for a lack of diversity. 36% of founders and 42% of investors feel like diversity is talked about too much in the media. So when you go into a room as a person of color, they're already like, oh, gosh, diversity, 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 because you get programmed by media, right? So they already have this, uh, this feeling. They feel some kind of way as soon as you walk in the room. And there's a great Harvard bias study that I encourage everyone to take. I've taken it. I have bias. But a lot of these people don't even know they have bias. They claim not to see the bias and the sexism. So if you look at this, and, and, uh, and notice here, even the women, okay, uh, women are yellow, men are blue. So there's a, you know, there's a significant number of women who have not experienced or witnessed sexism, and that's fine. That's fine. Congratulations. Happy for you. But acknowledge those that do and don't become part of the problem, because women can be part of the problem too, okay? Again, there's no passes, and we're not blaming any one person. This is a conditioning that we've all been exposed to. This is programming. We're encoded. We got DNA. We got all kinds of coding that happens, psychological and otherwise. And we're all affected by this. So Silicon Valley, like Hollywood, has their Me Too issue. And now it's been exposed. And because of technology, we can amplify it. I didn't have a Facebook or Twitter to talk about getting slapped on the butt at USC. I didn't have that. But we do now, and it can't be swept under the rug as easily. So in Silicon Valley, we have a corporate culture that's been exposed as problematic and toxic towards women and people of color. We have abuse of power in VC that's been exposed. We have the brotopia that Emily Chang talked about. And it's out in the open now. So guess what? Time's up. And I'm going to leave you with five keys of how we can solve these problems and what you can do, just some, some gems that I hope that you can leave and take action on, OK? So number one is stand in solidarity. Now, if you're going to stand in solidarity, you've got to have someone to stand with, right? So across ethnic lines, across gender lines, and certainly amongst your affinity groups, stand in solidarity. When you see abuse of power, don't be afraid to lose your privilege and stand in solidarity. When someone speaks up, listen to them. An example of solidarity that, that leads into key two, Octavia Spencer gave a beautiful testimony recently at Sundance about an experience with uh, Jessica Chaplain, who she worked with on the help. And they were having this talk about, oh, it's time for equal pay. And Octavia says, well, hold up, sister girl. I'm all for that. Yeah, they said they're dropping F-bombs and all that. I'm all for that. But when it comes to women of color, we're not getting paid as much as you. <laughs> and you know what Jessica did? And, this is, and Octavia was in tears when she talked about her. And I give her respect for this, and I give respect to any man who does this. I recently had a man who, who did this for me. She was silent. She listened. She acknowledged that she wasn't aware that that was the experience that her friend was having. And she said, oh, honey, we're going to get you paid on this next project. We're going to do a favorite nations. And now they're getting paid five times as much as what they asked for because they stood in solidarity. And the lesson to take away from that is add value to your network. Be that person that people want to work with. Have integrity. Be kind. So you got privilege, you got some Louis Vuitton, you got some red bottom shoes, okay? You gotta be a diva? And no disrespect to the, you know, good, there's some good divas out there, I'm just saying. People are human, everybody wakes up and puts one foot on the floor and before the other. We all have the same biological functions every day, okay? 
So just be a kind of person that you want to, and add value. Hook people up, introduce them to the others. Like, oh, you got a, a, a cool network? If it makes sense where the people can add value to each other, connect them so that we can disrupt the balance of power. And women are very good at that. We're good at putting together parties and because so, we've been socialized to do this. So use that to build a network and empower each other. And leverage technology. And so I use this for two examples. One is to give you the, the outcome of the EEOC study, which found that there was egregious discrimination, rampant discrimination against women in the industry. They've completed that investigation, and they're in settlements now with the six major studios. But this is an article on IndieWire, and I share it in the leverage technology, because if you're going to have solidarity and add value, one of the ways you can do that is being on social. Be on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn. LinkedIn, women under index on LinkedIn. Be on there and be visible. Be heard. Share these things. Tag people. Let them know what's going on. And keep yourself on the mind of your network by sharing things that you're reading, that you're, that you're passionate about, so that you can form groups of like-minded people, draw groups of like-minded people, connect. I don't care if you have children, if you're caregiving, stay connected. Keep adding value. Leverage technology. And face your fears. Take the risks. We're so conditioned to do the safe thing. Get your 401k, go this path, go that. Take some risks. High risk, high reward. Yes, it's going to be tough. But it's going to be tough if you work for a company for 10 years and they lay you out because they really don't care about you. All they care about is the bottom line. That's going to be tough. So take some risks. And if you're doing one through, through uh, three, you're going to have a network that's going to support you because you're a good person. You've added value. They're going to help you out. They're going to help you get that next job, that next gig. They're going to loan you that $500 for the emergency, let you borrow their car, give you a ride, share your events, whatever it is, share your projects. So take the risks and face your fears. If you reach out to someone and they don't get back to you, don't take it personally. They're probably busy. Maybe they're having an overwhelming week. It's not necessarily about you. And don't assume that, that they're some kind of person because they're having a, a tough week or they can't handle their workflow right now to, to prioritize you. Follow up in three weeks. Follow up in a month. Follow up in six months. Let them know your progress. Be friendly and persistent, not creepy and stalkerish. If every single one of you sent me a message on LinkedIn tomorrow, I would not be able to respond to you all. If you sent me one with a good message, I would, you would be on my radar. And if you are pleasantly persistent, I would do everything in my power to make time to be available or to be an asset to you. I'm only human, right? So don't assume when someone says no, you get some rejection, that you failed. Keep going, persist, pass the fear, be okay with that. Be willing to be embarrassed. Get comfortable with being uncomfortable. I tell the founders I work with all the time, make them stand in front of the wall of shame that shows who did bad homework and <laughs> you know, who was late and all. And, and they get ready to get their presentation. They just gotta stand there while we set up our stuff. And I tell them, get comfortable being uncomfortable. Because people will write bad press about you. They'll talk smack about you. They'll say how silly you are for not having that secure, cushy job. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, because if that's what you got to do to bootstrap, do that. But people will talk about you. They'll betray you. And you have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. It doesn't matter what you do, who you are, someone's not going to like you. And you have to be OK with that. And finally, Persist. Command respect. I had a, a mentor write to me and another a woman in venture capital about a founder she worked with who's raised $36 million for her company, which she's been running a number of years. She's hired other specialists that are more highly paid than her, and her board will not give her market rate pay. Now, that's understandable early on. You, you, that's perfectly normal for a founder to take reduced pay or no pay. And, and pay people to build a team. That makes perfect sense. But when you've raised 36 million, you've been at it for many years, it's your IP, you should be getting paid. And your board should work for you. 
So she's like, how do, what, you know, what, what advice would you give her? And one of the things I said is this, she's not going to get it because she's earned it. She's already earned it. Women, we've earned respect. We push out babies. We educate the children in this country. We're the nurses. Overwhelmingly, we care for people. We've earned respect. But it's not going to be given because we've earned it, because we've lifted up our husbands and our brothers. It's not going to just be given to us by the culture that's in power. You have to command it. I expect it. I deserve it. And I'm here to tell you, I don't want to be that B, but I will be if you don't give it to me. Because I'm tired of being tired. You have to command it. And they will give it to you when that's the expectation you set. I tell my girlfriend sometimes, a man will go as low as you let him go. Not every man. Not every man. But if you just out there, oh, you'll find men that will go low. They'll go low. But if you set the standard high, they'll go high. And men like respect. Even the Bible says, you know, to respect your husbands. Husbands love your wife. Women respect your husbands. And I tell women, men marry women they respect. They like to compete. They like sports. So hold a standard that I'm worth something. You got to rise to that. And that's what you have to do in the workforce, in your careers, in this world. Command it. I want equal pay. I want power. And I want respect. I've earned it. My ancestors have earned it. My sisters have earned it. And our world needs us to have it. So we don't have polluted oceans. We don't have our teenage girls sexualized and objectified and kidnapped and trafficked. And this happens to men, too. One in four girls are abused, one in five boys. But if we accept it for the women, they'll do it to everyone else. If we allow it in one community, they'll do it to another. So stand up, women, and command your respect. You deserve it. You've earned it. So with that, I thank you. I think we're going to open up, open up for questions. How, how many minutes do we have for questions? Five, Five minutes for questions. <laughs> There's always like the awkward delay. I'm like, should I be the first one? There she is. So I'm a current student here, but I'm also a current student at San Francisco State University in their broadcasting department. And I want to go into owning my own production company because there's not enough women of color in production as well as African American people who own their own media. So what would be um, your advice for someone going into owning their own um, media production company? Have you worked for any others or interned or? I have interned when I used to live down in Southern California. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I would say that one of the most important things is just to build your network and really research the business and put together a business canvas. Uh, you can find them online, the templates online, do a vision board, mind map, whatever you need to do, get the vision out of your mind onto the paper. It doesn't have to be a 50 page business plan, you know, a deck. You need something that you can share with people. Um, get a team. You need to start looking for a team. You need to kiss a lot of frogs. And sometimes, you know, it'll be small projects that you'll take on with people to see if they're the kind of people you can work with. People can wear masks for a long time. So it's all about team building, you know, get the vision down, build your team, really know your business model, how you're going to make your money, and your network is going to be the, it's going to be the, your main source of referrals, especially before you have a, a budget to do, you know, advertising. So, yeah. Yes, sir. I believe someone back here is videoing. I can help me answer that. So if you're, we're, uh, Mariah's presentation will be available to instructors to put on Canvas, and so you'll be able to watch it through your course website. OK. 
Okay, two questions. I think that's probably going to be all that we. Can you share with us how you started all these companies, uh, real briefly? Like, what was your first or in second steps? Um, well, as I mentioned, with the um, the friend, the Ghanaian friend who gave me the books, it really got me interested in um, in entrepreneurship. And you know, the cash flow quadrant has is self employed, has employed, self employed, business owner, investor. So on the left on the left side you're at a job or you're self-employed, lawyer, doctor, whatever, in private practice, and on the other side, your business works for you, your investments work for you, you can go off on vacation. So I, I understood that, but I had this, oftentimes you start with E, work your way to S, especially if you don't have privilege. Um, so I started a boutique production company, Light Star Entertainment, and I started doing commercials and uh, music videos, and you know, my husband had a production, he was in school for production, and so we'd use his equipment, and I used a school uh, refund, a school loan refund to buy my editing suite. And actually, I got a job, signed the contract, got a deposit up front, and used part of that money to go buy equipment. <laughs> and then I delivered and got the other half of the money. So that's how I started that company. And I kept that company for about a decade, I believe. Uh, it was really hard in LA to compete and be in school, so I worked for others and went into the financial industry, learned um, securities laws, and that's what led ultimately to CineShares, because as a producer, you, you know, you script to screen, uh, you know, finance, distribution, all of that. And so what I found is a lot of filmmakers were fundraising illegally. And because I knew the blue sky laws from being a FINRA licensed professional, I recognized that there was a need for a system that could provide compliant access to capital. And that's part of why I started uh, CineShares <clears throat> after my mother passed away. I said, okay, I'm free. It's time to go launch this business. And just started with uh, taking online courses and building, starting to build my network. And as I mentioned, you know, I started Diversity Ventures. It was already something I conceptualized when I applied to Kaufman, but um, I decided to launch out when I saw the problem. So just as I told this young lady, I did those exact steps. And I think there was you, and then final question. <clears throat> Send me a message on LinkedIn because I'm working on a project that's looking for integrations and, you know, I, I would say it's, it's probably going to be in your network and just offering your services to people. I would love to have my jewelry featured on your, on your you know, show. Um, I'll provide this many or some, just reaching out. Okay, cool. Thank you. And not being afraid of rejection. Or if yeah. you don't hear back, just keep going. Meet, meet uh, musicians. You know, and you know, it's as simple as this. Whoever you want to meet, people are more accessible than you might think. In Sacramento, there's there was a culture where it's kind of like, oh, here's the guest, and now we're going to usher them off stage, and you can't talk to them. But when you go to some place like the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, L.A., if you pay to get in a conference afterwards, you know, the people are going to be standing at the table shaking your hand, and you want to be in line, and and you know, you want to listen to what other people are saying, get the, you know, the rhythm of you know, who gets the response and what's awkward and people are like, oh, I hope I don't hear from them, kind of get the sense of that. And you know, you'll find yourself, you know, you'll go to places where musicians are, you'll go to concerts. I mean, I've gone to, I remember my friend and I were at a Met the Man, Red Man concert and we went to a signing earlier, we weren't able to, to make it, the line was too long, but we went to the concert and we were like in the middle. But we were like, we gonna meet them, we gonna meet them. We are just, we just knew, it was just, we just manifested it. So we're standing in there, and, his, and their people actually came into the crowd, and everyone singled out me and my friend and took us backstage, and we met them. And, and so, you know, just putting yourself in those places, and, you know, reach out to a lot of musicians are on LinkedIn. There's, uh, you know, I know at least one musician here who is looking for that kind of talent all the time and be willing to work for free. With up and comings, help build your network that's, when you're at ground level, build with other people that are ground level, and you come up together. You look at Ryan Coogler, and Michael B. Jordan and what they're doing, 
they built up together, and that's what you have to do. Be willing to take those risks and invest in each other. And again, you might kiss some frogs, you might be betrayed, but be willing to take those knocks and fail forward. So, that's my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you everyone for coming today. Thank you, Mariah, for your presentation. And you have given us a lot to think about. And uh, she will be around for a couple minutes if anyone wants to ask maybe a personal question, not a personal question, a one-on-one -on -one question. Um, and thank you again. And thank you for supporting Women's History Month.